thank you for your generous gift, and you can be sure to be useful up there in this church. We're going to turn services now with Brother Jim. If you will, turn in your hymn book to number 642. Number 642. It's a song of resolution. Beginning of the service today, I ask, are you happy? If not, why not? And that's a question all of us have to ask ourselves. I ask myself that question on a daily basis. The Lord has been very good to me. Uh, he's given me fairly good health, a good occupation, certainly a good church family and people to be with. I know everybody in this house that sits here today. And somewhere in my mind, there's a niche that everybody is a part of, and that's the way the family of God ought to be. We ought to be a family. I want you to think on this. We, we are so blessed here at Lacey Creek. We've got about four or five young men uh, that can preach. And I didn't put myself in that category. I'm getting some, some time on me and mileage, but it's been a good run. I don't have any regrets. I like to think of myself the same as Paul did. I am free from the blood of all men. I have never stood in this place and preached to you anything else but that you are responsible before God for your life that you live on this earth and how you interact with Him and how you interact with other people. None of us like to be burdened, but we are. The Bible said, and I thought about this, the Bible says that each one of us will bear our own burden, but we also bear other people's burdens, do we not? You can't take one verse out of context, but you need to look at the whole scope of the plan of God. You need to understand it. Why that in a particular time this happened. In this particular time that this happened. As God goes through the same stages or cycle of his plan. We bear each other's burdens. We're told that in the Bible too, and the Bible says that this is the fulfillment of the royal law. Each man individually in the judgment day of God will give an account of the deeds done in the body. That's the burden that we bear individually. I will not answer for another man or woman's sin. You will not answer for another individual's sin. But we will answer for our own individual life. That part is true and will never change. But when you get into the portion of where he says, bear each other's burdens because this is the fulfillment of the law. We're burdened for our children when they don't act the way they should or they get themselves in, in trouble. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I want you to have common sense. There's cause and effect in the Bible. There's cause and effect for the laws of nature. There are cause and effect in the sight of God. Are you unhappy? If you are, then why are you unhappy when you're living in the best days of this nation? You live better. You live comfortably. You have more to spend. You have better selections of food to eat. And yet this generation, there is something wrong, and it is in the spiritual realm. You cannot be at, at, at good terms with others when you are having trouble inside. And that's what the church needs to fix. And the only way that we can fix it is to convince people you need to listen to the voice of God. Cause and effect. There's people in jail this morning because they made a decision last night to get drunk. There's young women that lost their virginity last night because they chose to be immoral. There are babies conceived last night because someone <coughs> did not make a good decision. And you say, preacher, what are you talking about? 
You will carry the burden of that. Society will carry the burden for others' actions. Thomas Jefferson once said that said freedom will only work for a moral people. And when we lose our morals in this country, we'll be, we'll be regulated by laws. And we're being done that. We've got laws now that regulate because we cheat. And so laws are passed. And our prisons are filling up. And it costs us a tremendous amount of money. Ask Dan hit upon what it costs to keep a prisoner down at Middle Sandy. The last account I had was $25,000 a year per prisoner. You tell me that sin is not breaking the back of this nation. And it is on your back. What we teach, how we act, for every action, there is a reaction. There's a brother here in church that when he says in his prayer, he says, let us apply to our daily lives the things that we're being taught. Think about that a minute. Think about it. Where we're at in life because we make certain decisions. And there are professional people in here that studied and stayed up late at night and just almost busted their head to get to where they're at now. And I'll guarantee you they will not tell you there was any fun in learning. I'll tell you where the fun is, is when you step out into society and take upon yourself that profession and you start to help people. Right, Doc? People miss a lot of blessings as Christians because we fail to apply not only to ourselves but to those around us. Love and goodness, mercy, understanding. And yet we are in a stage of critical. We are being critical. From our news media down, right on down to the church. And I refuse to be critical. You do with your life whatever you want to do, but make sure that you know this, that account has to be given before God. There's enough gospel preached in this church, and there's people walk away from it every Sunday bound for hell because they have not obeyed the gospel of Christ and are being fed this thing that that's okay, I don't need to do that. Go ahead, it's your decision and it's going to come back to haunt you in eternity. There's enough gospel preached. I'm going to come from the flip side of that and say we need to apply what we hear. If we don't, we have missed the mark. There's a place in the Bible and I get into interesting things and and this over here on the wall, and somebody says that was done away with. Don't you believe it for a minute. It became a part of something better. Don't you ever believe that for a minute. Disobey those. The first one says, Thou shalt have no other God before me. And there's God's plenty, Lord's plenty. There's people that won't go to church because they're too busy doing something else. And that has become their idol. Whether it is leisure, whether it is fashion, whatever it may be that separates you from God, that has become your God. And he said, Don't put it in front of me. There's one, and we studied about it in Sunday school this morning. And if you're not in Sunday school, why are you not here? Why can't we get ourselves out of the bed one hour earlier? I think I could do that for God. I think I could do that for Him. I think I need to be here so I can learn more. Think about it. One of the hardest days of the week is the first day of the week. It's the day of the Lord of worship. 
All you've got to do to make that easier is get up 30 minutes, roll out. Let's be men and women about it. Get your children to Sunday school where they can learn. The time for excuses is over. It's done. It is past. It's got us in the trouble that we're in today. Immorality is sky high. Why? Because we fail to teach. God hates slothfulness. I cannot be a good servant of God and be slothful in my business, in my friendships, and in any way. And slothfulness is a catching thing. I don't like to be around lazy people. Don't like it. Because I've got to fight against that, see you? Quit kidding yourself. We are who we are, and we are what we are. And I'd like to think by the grace of God that if you're a happy Christian here today, I've known people that retard, they quit. They quit. Right at the time when they had the valuable information and the ability to help someone, they got tired. And they quit. We're going to pay a price for it. Maybe we already are. There was a time in the plan of God that God looked ahead of us that there was going to be a famine in the land. And so he set in motion to have Joseph to become second in command of Egypt. The Egyptians fared well. Think about it, man. They fared well because of the wisdom that God had transferred to Moses or to Joseph. And he said, famine's coming. And so they stopped their barns. And when famine came, they had plenty. That went on for a period of time. And then the time came for the deliverance from the people of God. God has a schedule. God does not deviate. God is true. God will fulfill what he said. God will do what he proposes he will perform. There's an interesting saying in the Bible. There come a time when they knew not Joseph. The leadership of our country is now being handed to another generation does not have the same set of morals and ethics. Just as the Egyptians, when a new Pharaoh had been raised up, the situation changed. And you know why? Pharaoh took some bad advice. They come to him and say, look, them Hebrew women is having babies all over the place, and the next thing you know, they're going to outnumber us. And that put a bug in his head. Does that sound familiar today? Why some people are afraid of other nationalities? They're going to be more than we. Why not take this attitude? We need those people. We are aging. Many of us are on Social Security, and many will be. Japan has already, they blocked out immigration of their country, and now they have an aged population, and they have no one to work and pay in to the system. Why not take the wisdom to incorporate that into that great body? That Pharaoh could have done it, but he didn't. He listened to bad advice. And he brought down on them the hammer. He put them in bondage. He worked them like dogs. He treated them like dogs until their prayers went up before God. And he said, Moses, I've got to do this in 30 minutes. They knew not Pharaoh. They knew not Joseph. 
Think about it. Think about it. Change is inevitable. We have changes in our body. The biggest fight that I have, I'm happy. I am happy. I really am. God has been good to me. But one of the hardest things that I'm adjusting to now is my head tells my body to do something and it says, what are you talking about? I see grins all over the house. It's happening to you. Change is inevitable. Change will come. Why not make it a good change? Why do we not direct change into a positive way instead of letting it be negative? Obedience or application to the words you hear on this Sunday, on these Sundays, is for your benefit. It's for your benefit. And we have ministers that bring you the truth. They're not going to tell you something counterfeit or you come in some other way. I mean, it's right down the line. But I'm going to the flip side of application. It makes no difference to me if I know everything in the world, if I do not apply it, what good has knowledge done me? Matter of fact, you'll probably forget it if you don't use it. Use it or lose it. I want to go quickly here now to the book of Deuteronomy. If you want to follow me in chapter 11, I want to touch on three or four things. How many of you remember the account of Saul? And, and, and God had given them a king because the people wanted to. They said, we want to be like everybody else. They had good judges. They, everything was going good. They said, no, 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 we don't want that anymore. We want change. They brought Saul up. And that's a big mistake. <coughs> but at the end, my point being, when I talk about obedience, this is what the man of God Samuel told Saul. He said, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. God likes obedience. You say, I don't like to obey, uh, obey anybody. You don't have to. You don't have to do a thing to go to hell. You don't have to do a thing to be lost. Just not do nothing. But if you care enough about your eternal soul and your destiny with God, there are some things you need to do. Deuteronomy chapter 11. This is where Moses addressed the children of Israel prior to going over into Canaan, the promised land. He said in, chap in verse 16 of chapter 11, he said, Take heed to yourself lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Whoa! <coughs> he talks about the heart of man in the head. That's where we get deceived. And he said, please don't do that. Don't be deceived. Lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you. And they say, well, that's the first time I've heard that. God is a God of love. God is a just God. God is a merciful God. God is giving us grace now. He'll give us justice when our eyes close and we leave this earth. You can count on it. You can take it to the bank. God will be a God of justice. Lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you and He shut up the heavens so that there be no rain and the land yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord has given you. God can do that, you know. He can do whatever He wants to. Whether you believe it or not, or whether I believe it or not, God can do whatever He wants to do. I feel good about that. I like to follow somebody that's in charge, somebody that knows what's going on, somebody that's not in disarray, somebody that has the answers of life. I like that. He said, therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. Whoop, inside. 
inside, sink in your head, sink in your soul, sink in your very being. <coughs> and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. That's figuratively there. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. For every action, there's a reaction in our children. When they are abused and harmed, they became bitter and they become abusers of harm. When they are treated with love and respect, that eventually will be their possession. God told the Israelites, be sure you teach. Be sure you do that. In verse 26, this is what I'm doing your day. You do with your life whatever you want to. I used to worry a whole lot because it didn't seem like that anything was happening and finally God said, that ain't your business. Your job is to preach. <clears throat> you put it out there. If you don't, that's your responsibility. But I am free from the flood of all men. I don't care what people think about me, and you'd be surprised how many people are unhappy today because they think somebody thinks something bad about them. They're going to do it anyway. I told somebody one time, if you want to lose your friends, become successful. Just become successful. <coughs> your true friends will. But your friends, so said, will desert you. In verse 26, Behold, I set before you today a blessing or a curse. There it is. I have often thought that it would be horrible to live to be 80 or 90 year old and be bitter about something or hating something or having the mindset that didn't bring happiness. What in the world have I done anyway? I'd rather be happy. And you can be that way. It is up to you to make decisions about your happiness. How you think, you can be critical of everybody and everything that happens. Or you can try to understand. And try to understand people. Try to get in their head. And see why they're thinking the way they think and what they think. But here Moses told him, look, there's two things in life. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, here it is, self-explanatory. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. That's the blessing end. And the curse. And the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I have commanded you today to go after other gods which you have not known. Let me ask you something. Now let's make common sense. If I don't have time for God in my life, why should God have time for me? Is that fair? I'm going to do what I want to. I'm going to live the way I want to. And just before I die, I'm going to say, Lord, take me home. Now, do you see any justification in that kind of preaching? <coughs> Would it be fair to the old saints of God that sit in this church and have labored and done everything they could and somebody walk through the door and get the same reward? It ain't going to happen. You can write it down. It ain't going to happen. They say, well, now everybody gets the same reward. You better study your book. 
study your book and see what it says. I don't want him to say, Jimmy, you lazy. You put everything in the world before me. You won't go to church. You won't do this. You won't do this. You don't do this. Do you think he's going to look favorably on me? Ain't going to happen, folks. We can think whatever we want to think. But it ain't going to happen. He said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. The blessing, the curse. Take your choice. It's good to have choice. God doesn't beat anybody into submission. He puts it in front of me. He said, You want to be happy? Live this way. You want all kinds of problems? Go that way. As I close in the 32nd verse. And you shall be careful to observe all of the statutes and judgments which I set before you today. And somebody says you are reading out of the Old Testament. And so I am. I'm here. You put anything above him that has become your God. Whether it be time. Whether it be pleasure. Whether it be leisure. Whatever it is that you love more than God. That has become your God. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. I don't need to see God. If I need to see God, that's a lack of my faith. I know that he is in the reward of them that diligently seek him. Go to the third. You shall not take the name of the Lord God in vain. Vain means vanity. Vain means empty. It makes, and they're doing it today, if you want to discourage something, downplay it. You want to destroy something, discredit it. And that's what they're doing with God in this nation today. He said, don't let it happen to you. Remember the Sabbath. Now that one right there, real quick. I learned things from people. I'm not a self-made man. I've had people tell me that, oh, I'm a self-made man. No, you're not. And if you was, you'd worship yourself instead of the one that made you. I'm a product of a lot of teaching that come through this church and over the years. I have learned from that and I have taken from others the good part and applied them to life and discarded the bad. Brother Harold Frederick told me one time we were talking about the self. I talked to Jackie a little bit about it. I hope it helps you. Anything that I do that outside of my realm of work becomes a race. Let's suppose that you run a business six days a week and you don't do anything else but you run it on the seven. There's no race. No, we're not to observe that as the commandment the church meets on the first day of the week according to the book of Acts. So I want to go quickly to that, but I'll tell you when my Sabbath is. My Sabbath is any day and any time when I can step into my little garden in the evening and I can hear the night sounds around me and the things that God has made and created. And I put my hands in the earth. Or right now, <laughs> I don't know about to produce. That's up to him, the production. That's my time. Your Sabbath should be doing anything differently than what you do for a living and a vocation, and you need some time. Somebody said, well, I'll take two weeks a year. That won't cut it. What happens to the other 50? When your mind is troubled and everything, when all you've got to do is pick out a few hours that's different from your job. Do something you like to do. And that could vary as as many different people that are in here. That is your time of rest. God rested. Rested. That's the word on the Sabbath. He rested from his labors. Let's go on real quick. Honor thy father and thy mother. Boy. That was your trouble today. That was a bad trouble. 
I taught my kids, you give somebody else a problem, you got a problem, you get home. You give your teacher a problem in school, you got a problem with me. That's not being done. We defend children. Foul mouth children. What do we expect? might hurt their feelings and cause them to have bad feelings for life. I got plenty of it and should have had more than what I got away with. Now you do with your kids whatever you want to. But it is so disheartening to be out in public and watch a five or six year old dictate to their mom and dad, if you don't give me something before we leave you, I'm going to throw a fit. I'd give them a fit. <laughs> You do with yours whatever you want. But you can't walk away from the results. What do other people say about your kids? Those are the best little kids I have ever seen. Are they with us? <laughs> Am I wrong on any of this? Pity if somebody had the courage to stand up and say, you're wrong. We've needed this for a long time. I've needed this. I needed to get it out of my system because I see my world deteriorating around me and I've said very little. Real quick. Thou shalt not kill. That means murder. It doesn't mean you don't kill you something to eat and have for food. Those people tell you, oh, don't kill nothing. Let humanity starve to death, but let the spotted owl go. I'm better than an owl. I'm better than a rabbit. I'm better than a fox. My goodness, where did common sense go in this country? Oh, I hope it never happens to lace the green. It simply means murder, and that's wrong. God didn't do away with those. You see, boy, we still live by them today. If you live by those right here, you live by those, you're going to be pretty good. The plan of salvation is in there, too. Tells us how we need to be a Christian and what we need to do and how we need to live. It's in there. Why would we not want personal happiness? It doesn't make any sense. That should not commit adultery. That can be dangerous. You could lose your life. And that happens all the time. But what they don't teach you is what happens after adultery. Whether it be a man or a woman, they don't tell you the repercussions of an act like that. Shame and degradation, separation of families, and maybe even loss of life. Don't do it. It's not worth the act. Thou shalt not steal. Here we go. Two things I hate. It's a thief or a liar. You can't trust either one of them. A liar, you don't know when he's telling you the truth or when he's not telling you the truth. What's that done to us today? Go get along with the bank. Maybe years ago I could walk in any place, do a handshake, get what money I need, and walk out. Now it's 10 pages. Ten pages. Hey, I've known you all my life. You see what we've done to ourselves? Sin kills us. Sin will break the back of any people. And it's already breaking. It's already costing good people. I'm not going where Doc's at, but I will guarantee you that the paperwork that that man has to do is tremendous. Amen. Folks, we're in trouble. You say, I'm in trouble. Yes, you are. You're still alive and here, ain't you? <laughs> You're in trouble. I'm in trouble. But what we got to do <clears throat> is to find our niche, our happiness. And say, if the world goes to hell in a handbasket around me, it's not going to happen to me. What will happen to me? 
Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Jesus, on one occasion, he came to Peter and John and he said, Hey, who do men say that I am? They said, Well, you're Elijah or one of the prophets. He didn't care what people said. Who do you say that I am? I've always said I don't care what any man or woman will tell on me. You just tell the truth. Tell the truth. And I don't care. People will say things about you because they envy you. They don't like your success. They're going to do all kinds of things. That's their sin, not yours. Thou shalt not cut it. Oh, boy. That's a hard one, isn't it? If I see things and I, I gotta have maps. I gotta have it, gotta have it, gotta have it. Gotta have it. Advertisements come on TV, you need it, you need it, you need it. <laughs> and I say, I gotta have it, gotta have it, gotta have it. And the next thing you know, I can't afford it. There's people that spin themselves into unhappiness beyond the Christian. <coughs> That's what that word means. I like to take, and all of us are different. I, I'm not saying anything bad about heaven. You know me better than that. But it's where it possesses us. It's where it becomes our God. It's where it becomes our way of life. And it'll create all kinds. Jesus gave an illustration of that one time, and I don't know how many people heard it or knew it. Or he said, "Look at the, look at the, look at the birds in the field." Now I'm not telling you quit work. You better work. But to what extent? He said, "If you've got raiment, you've got food. Be there." No content. I shouldn't say no. There are some people contented. But the vast majority of these people in this world, they are not contented. And I look for reasons, cause and effect. Something just didn't happen. I like clothes. I'm not into fashion. If you are, that's fine. I don't have a problem with you can pull it. I like soup beans. <laughs> Occasional steak. I get happy when I get a steak. I had that every day of my life. I don't one day I have to look forward to. You know. The biggest decision we make is our condition with God. You've heard about him in this place. You know about it. Now, I don't know how many of you believe it. The vast majority do, but somebody's here today said, yeah, I've heard about it. I don't believe that. You'll never get any point. That's as far as you'll get in your relationship with God. But when you say, yeah, I believe that. I want to be happier than I am now. I want to do away with the thoughts of hell of being lost. I want, I want to sleep good of a night. I want, to, I want to do these things. I believe that. Someone say, might say, my position in life will allow that. Some of the greatest men in the Bible were followers of God. Did you know that? Hear it and to believe it in the stage of repentance. It says, I am tired of my condition. I am tired of living the way I'm living. Turn to 
Show me around. Once we have done that, we need to acknowledge in our life that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We need to do that. brave within the baptism for the remission of sin. You may say, well, I've heard all my life that baptism don't amount to nothing. Well, why don't you just disregard the Bible? Know you not as many of us were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I can't put something on that I never had. It is a death, it is a burial, it is a resurrection. That's what it is. And the blood and the spirit meet in the water. You need to do those things. Or you ain't going to make it. I have enjoyed today immensely. I hope you've done the same. I hope we have learned something and now let's go out and apply it. Let's go out and do it. Let's go out and change. We're going to stand now and say number 642. If you're here, you're not a Christian. You've never been a Christian. Try it. You'll like it. If you don't, go back to your old way of living. God doesn't tie us to anything.